Imagine being told you have cancer. Now, imagine being told you only have years to live. What do you do? I hope you do what today's guest did, and that's fight. You see, I connected with Chris Carr, the acclaimed health advocate who's been on Good Morning America and Oprah and Access Hollywood and more to dig into her raw, heartfelt story, one of loss and grief, and how to find the courage to rebuild. And here's what's coming up. A year has gone by where I don't imagine us being old and one of us having cancer, and it terrifies me, and it's never going away, and I don't know how you live with it every day. I can tell you my secret. Are you ready? I don't yeah. think about it every day. <laughs> so have I just been brainwashed by like American media into believing that plant-based is not good? I mean, it's hard because I think the word vegan comes with so much baggage. Living in the present. I think that's hard for most people to do, to be present and be truly present. Is that where you spend most of your time in your mind? Not where I spend most of my time, but it is the practice that I rely on to basically find my center, stay grounded. But I think living with stage four cancer has taught me anything. I have to learn how to like be the boss of this shit. I have to be in charge. I have to become the CEO of my health. Welcome to The Mark Drager Show, where we explore the minds and stories of remarkable entrepreneurs, creatives, and total badasses. My wife and I have been together for uh, for 23 years. We've been married for 18. And I don't think a, a year has gone by where I don't imagine us being old mm -hmm. and one of us having cancer and it terrifies me and it's never going away. And I don't know how you live with it every day. Mm. Well, that's a really great question. And I can tell you my secret. Are you ready? I don't think about it every day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, okay. There we go. <laughs> and I don't tell myself scary ass stories that would make me, you know, paralyzed um, by life or by this, my reality and my circumstances. So I think that honestly, so much of the work that I do for myself personally is mental management, mental fortitude and just staying as grounded and present as possible. Because if I start to future trip, you know, not, nothing good happens. Like I don't tell myself the best stories that I'm ever going to hear in my whole life. No, I often, if I get to that place, I'll tell myself the worst stories. And so just in those moments of just being like, oh, this is my, what my brain does. This is what anxiety looks like. Um, let me just come back to this moment where I'm hanging out with my friend, Mark. You know, I'm not at my funeral. I'm not like pissed that, you know, my husband brought hired a DJ instead of a proper violinist. No, you come know, on. Now he, I'm he mad at him. <laughs> and now I'm going to bring that to dinner. Oh, and by the way, he started dating again so soon after my passing. That's another reason I'm going to be a little pissed about, you know, our dinner tonight and what I'm going to say. You, you know what I mean? This is what our brains do. Have you ever played the game? Because... um I used to joke with my wife where I was like, I'm going to totally Mary Poppins this thing. Like, if anything happens, I got four kids. They were young at the time. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So I need some woman to swoop in and, or maybe Sound of Music. Let's go that route because at least it ends with a wedding. Um, but do you guys ever play? How do you play the future game when this is always there? We don't play the future game. If I played the future game, honestly, I would be playing the game where I'm the one who survives and I live with cats and I have a, like an apartment at the Ritz Carlton and I never have to do anything like mow the lawn because that is not my genius zone. So it's like, I'm, if I want to play the future trip game, I'm the one that lives. Okay. And so before we actually jumped on the recording, we, we were kind of joking around about love languages and stuff, but it's almost similar to that in terms of like, I believe that some people kind of live their lives in the past and they can get stuck in the past. And I can fall that way where we become very sentimental. Uh, we can become a little bit down. We can become depressed. We can feel like the best days were behind us. Uh, others uh, tend to maybe really live in the future like we were talking about where you know, you're know you all in your head and we can be a little bit more wound up, more anxiety, um, a little bit more uncertain. But I can, I mean, I can fall in that category too. I can live my whole life in the future, never get around to living. <laughs> living in the present. <sighs> I feel like that's probably going to be your jam. Um, but I think that's hard for most people to do, to be present and be truly present. Is that where you spend most of your time in your mind? Not where I spend most of my time, but it is the practice that I um, rely on to basically find my center, stay grounded, stay in alignment with myself, um, be a good leader, be a good partner, 
Uh, so that's what I try to do more often than not. It doesn't mean that I don't vision the future. It doesn't mean that I don't have big dreams. It doesn't mean that I don't get scared and frightened and anxious about a whole lot of things. But I think if living with stage four cancer has taught me anything, um, that I can, it has taught me that I can waste time if I'm going to ruminate, if I'm going to be in worry, if I'm going to imagine all the terrible things that could happen not only to my physical body, but to my life in general. And so it doesn't mean that I was good at that in the beginning. And it doesn't mean that I'm always good at it now. And in fact, when I was newly diagnosed, the first doctor suggested a triple organ transplant. The next doctor gave me 10 years to live. And I was like, holy shit, I have to learn how to like be the boss of this shit. I have to be in charge. I have to become the CEO of my health. I need to hire, I need to fire, I need to build a team and I need to get as much information as possible because the things that I'm hearing make absolutely no sense to me. At least I knew that, right? And so I put my focus there. The next place I put my focus in was like, okay, what can I control? Because life is out of control. Cancer is out of control. You know, what can I control? Well, the only thing I can control is like what I eat. That's that's where I started. And, you know, I started to feel better even though I still have cancer. I was like, Oh my God, I got off the standard American diet. What a concept. You know what I mean? Like I I started to eat real food and then teach people about that and feel better than I had ever felt even before cancer. Right. But at some point, Mark, I realized like these lifestyle practices that I, um, I, I became so passionate about would unravel if I wasn't also addressing my mind and my mindset. And, um, and so I often say that like the first half of my career, I've been doing this for 20 years now, the first half of my career, I really focused on helping other people address what they're eating. This time I find myself in life is I'm helping myself and other people address what's eating them. Because that's the holistic practice. And so we can look and say, okay, what part of life is out of balance for me? You know, and oftentimes... For many of us, especially post pandemic, po- like the stress of the world, it's our mental health and well being. You know, so then I took all the passion that I had for plant based living and kind of started to pour it into. Is, is, is plant based living just a rebrand of veganism because no one wants to say that word anymore? <laughs> I mean, you can be vegan and still wear, I mean, you could be plant based and still wear leather and, you know, still, still if you can be plant based and mostly plants, like, we can call us something else. Like, you know what I mean? Like I, I, it's hard because I think the word vegan comes with so much baggage. Exactly. And that's why I was wondering, because I was like, Ooh, plant-based. Yeah. I've heard that and I like it and it sounds good. And it's it's like fantastic. It's like, uh, it's like, uh, whatever corn sugar versus whatever the real thing is, or they just keep rebranding things, right? Natural corn sugar, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, plant-based is definitely not natural corn sugar, but yeah, no, you, my point is that, you know, if if you're living a holistic lifestyle, you have to be thinking about your mental well being as well. And so, what changed? You said you spent the first ten years focused on uh, what people ate, and then now the next ten years, the last ten years, uh, on what is eating each of us. Um, what changed in your life? How did that focus switch? I had been trying to cure myself of stage four cancer because the doctors couldn't do that, so I figured I better do this myself. So, you know, it's like super type A. It's uh, like super hyper vigilant. You know, these are my wounds. This is my baggage. I'm like, oh, yeah, you can't do it. I guess I have to do it myself then. <laughs> like everything else. Great. You know, add this to the list. And um, so there was a time where I wouldn't have probably come on a show like yours because I would have thought, he's not going to want to talk to me. I don't have like this victorious uh, end to my story. Like she had cancer, she cured her cancer. Now she's here to speak about it and inspire the masses. <laughs> you know, it's like, because we live in such a binary wor- world. It's either black or white. You know, it's either somebody's winning or somebody's losing. And I think that's so destructive, you know. Um, but I, I fell prey to that. And so I was trying to cure myself, not just so I could come on your show, Mark, but... <laughs> Achievement made. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I got your bio and we can go ahead and cross off, you know, Today and Good Morning America and Oprah Winfrey and, you know, Vogue and Forbes, like the Mark Drager show. That's where it's at. Hey, a girl can dream. Um, 
not just because I wanted to be able to share my story, but because it's really scary to imagine. I didn't know anybody who lived with stage four cancer. I just figured you got sick, you tried to get well, and then you tried to move on with your life and put it back together somehow. I don't know how, but like, isn't that the story that most of the time we think of when we think of cancer or we think that the person didn't, you know, didn't make it. Um, and so, so again, I didn't have a lot of role models 20 years ago. And, um, I thought that unless I was cured, I'd have to keep my life on pause until some magical day when the doctor said you're in remission that never happened. It may never happen and happen. And so I remember at my 10 year scan, everybody was happy but me. Um, now, meanwhile, I outlived at that point my original expiration date. And I was just like, it wasn't good enough, Mark. It wasn't good enough that I was still doing just fine. And because on, you, you wanted that end point. Like I you wanted, wanted that end point. I wanted that trophy. I wanted this thing behind me. Um, so that I could go on living my life. And so so it was the drive home where I said to myself, what if you live to like to your 90s, well past your husband and you get to be with your cats living in the penthouse of the Ritz Carlton. Ritz Carlton, yeah, yeah. Okay, where people just like br- bring you plant-based food for lunch. Like what if you get to have that dream, but this entire time you wasted it all because it wasn't good enough because you thought to yourself, you couldn't get busy living unless the medical report said exactly what you wanted it to say. And I was like, what a waste. You have a choice. You can keep going down that path or you can choose to get busy living right now, regardless of how many tumors are in your body. And that was the fucking turning point. Oh, I, feel, I feel like I need a moment there because I actually have goosebumps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the audience doesn't realize I'm actually taking a moment here. Um, you know, I had Tony Horton, uh, the founder of P90X on the podcast. And uh, a few years ago, he went through uh, a pretty life altering uh, disease that started to shut down, you know, part of his face and started to lose um, parts of, of his um, function. And I was just so I was inquiring so much about like, you know, how did you get through that? And how did you live with it? And how did you do this? And how did you do that? And how did you feel about it? And it just came down to like, well, Tony's like, I just didn't have a choice. Yeah. And um, I love biographies. Uh, if we go way back, uh, JD Rockefeller, um, his biography, he worked himself so hard through his 20s and into his early 30s. He had to take two, a two-year medical leave from work. Um, he had to literally go to Europe in the 18, whatever it was, 70s or 80s and take two years to be able to recover. And he thought he may never work again um, because he'd worked so hard. And I remember reading that thinking, two years? My goodness, like that is so much time. What a delay. And when I hear your story and I think of talking to Tony you know, Horton and I think of J.D. Rockefeller or anyone who's been ill... Um, you just don't have a choice, right? Like, like you can waste a lot of time or you can just say like, I just don't have a choice in this. And then I have to imagine it becomes a lot more about what do I have to do to have the best quality of life? What do I have to do to show up the very best that I can show up? What do I have to do to limit the amount of recovery time? And, and you have to make certain sacrifices and, or, or you have to dedicate yourself in some areas of your life just so that way you can show up in the other areas the best you possibly can. Is did that shift have to kind of? It sounds like it took place for you, but is that is am I starting to understand through pattern recognition that this is what we have to do sometimes? I think you put it so well and so beautifully. You know, with the disease that I have, I currently don't have symptoms right now, so my disease can be very fast growing and it can be slow growing, and it can start slow and then become fast, and so. When I finally found my doctor, he suggested a watch and wait approach. And I, he, you know, like let cancer make the first move. And that's when I was like, are you high? And can I get some? You know, like, what do you mean? Let cancer make the first move. That sounded terrifying. And so, and he said, but what I want you to do, because we've got to get a baseline. So we're going to scan you every couple of months and every six months and one year. And, you know, now I'm at five years. He said, what I want you to do is go off and watch and live. And that was the inciting incident, you know, and eventually I had to get to the fact of like, okay, you want to be cured. Like, what does live look like? Can you live and still have something that you wish you didn't have? Yeah. Um, So I don't have symptoms currently and my disease is slow growing currently and that could change. 
Um, but along the way, I've had other autoimmune issues that have like affected me in very debilitating ways. And so if anything, I resonate a bit more with how you're positioning it when I think about some of my autoimmune stuff, because you don't have a choice. And when I think about, you know, my father recently passed of pancreatic cancer, didn't have a choice. And so you have to choose other things. And what I think is so powerful for all of us is we have a finite amount of energy, even if we're like hacking our bodies and taking the latest powder and potion and all the kind of stuff, you know, like who doesn't want to have longevity and like supercharge our beings? We all do, but we have a finite amount of time and we have a finite amount of energy. And I think it's every single one of us should do the inventory as if you had cancer for a day. How would that change the way you're living? How would that change the decisions that you made today? Not in a morbid way, like don't traumatize yourself, but in the, you know what? I actually wouldn't go play golf with Jack. I've never liked Jack in the first place. Well, I, I mean, in my experience, Jack is an asshole. I Jack mean... It's a jackass. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> <laughs> I think of how this might apply to our audience because health is always kind of in the back of our mind. At least I feel like it should be. Um, but but often we're so busy just trying to either... I think people are either trying to just get through the days because either tired and they're maybe not healthy, stressed out, overwhelmed, not sleeping enough, not hydrating. Like all, like I feel like in my head, there's the classic like people who don't take care of their health. And then they're the people who do focus on their health and, you know, spend a lot of time and a lot of effort on these things. And so I know for myself, I didn't used to be healthy. I'm more healthy than I used to be. Um, and I've also been able to take the next level of going like, okay, so in my role as a leader, I need to show up confident. Mm. Uh, I need to be strategic and I need to be decisive. And I started looking at um, my my health, my 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 sleep, my exercise, my diet, uh, the people I spent time with, what I listened to, I started looking at all areas of my life to say, are these things helping me show up more confident, more decisive, more strategic, or are they taking away from those things that are required of me as a leader? <laughs> Have you ever worked through any kind of analysis like that? Or do you tend to feel your way things through things a little bit more? I probably should work myself especially, uh, you know, like in my role as the CEO of our business, I probably should take a page from you more. I, I tend to feel my way through things. I, I think you're actually right about that. Um, I also, my definition of confident is basically choosing courage more often than not, because I'm not confident at a lot of things, like a lot of things. <laughs> but it's like, okay, you've got a choice here. Are you going to make take courageous action? Are you going to, you know, take a leap? Are you going to do something that's going to stretch yourself? And that tends to be the thing that is my North Star more than confidence, like the traditional sense of confidence. That is so interesting because I am always more than willing to take a leap. Like, you know, if there, <laughs> I'm usually the guy who's like, let's go, let's do this crazy thing. We have no plan for, no experience, no idea, but that's okay. And so if anything, my version of confidence is more like, am I confident in myself and that this is actually something we should do as opposed to more of just like a whim, like this is going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to circle around on a video that you put up uh, about six months ago. And in the video, when I went through the comments, uh, a lot of positive comments, you have a really amazing community, but people were noting, um, people were noting one thing that kind of kept coming out. And that's the idea that while your version of kind of your detour um, and I can't recall uh, the exact word you used. It started with an R. It was like... Rupture? Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's why. That's not like one of the regular words in my vocabulary. But that that this sudden thing that happened to you and that might happen to other people also show up in other areas of our lives. And being able to navigate these surprises in life, these ruptures, um, the steps can be the same. Um, I found that so interesting because... Um, for myself, at least, I tend to go like, that's a health issue. That's a relationship issue. That's a business issue. That's a this issue. But the under the underlying lessons can be applied to any type of disruption that comes our way in life. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, that's great. Um, so in my new book, which is called I'm Not a Morning Person, um, and it's about braving loss and grief in the 
big, messy emotions that happen when life falls apart. I talk about rupture and I talk about rupture being like that moment where life changes. And oftentimes it's unexpected. It's the moment where you feel like the rug has been pulled out from under you, um, that you have to pick up the pieces. And like you so beautifully said, it can be in so many different areas. You know, it's the, it's when you get fired. It's when your partner cheats on you. It's when the miscarriage happens, the diagnosis, it's the loss of a loved one. Um, so they come in all shapes and sizes and none of us are immune to them. But we live, in my estimation, we live in a grief phobic, messy emotions averse society. So few of us know how to deal with loss and those are all losses. But what we do know how to do is avoid pain and we're very good at it. And so the rupture, the normalizing of rupture is just saying, hey, it's going to happen. We can't say, hey, I want the rainbow, but not the rain, right? It's going to happen. And there are common elements, as you just so beautifully said. One of the things that I talk about specifically in that rupture chapter is oftentimes we can find ourselves asking, why did this happen to me? Why wasn't I good enough? Oh, why all of the things that we as humans want to know, because we want to fill in the gap so it never happens again, right? If you find yourself in rupture and you find yourself stuck in that, why did this happen? One of the things that I suggest is sometimes we can answer that question. Sometimes we can. You know, why did my car run out of gas? It's because you didn't fill it when it was on E. You know, it's simple. But some whys we can't answer. And I think what a better thing to do is say, ask yourself the question, what can I do now? Yes, this happened. But what can I do now to support my mental health? What can I do now to support my physical health? What can I do now to support my spirit? What can I do now? Um, I think it's a really good first step. And I'm almost wondering if we stack a few of these ideas we've been circling around on. Um, if you don't accuse me of leading you too much, you know, so, so this rupture happens. And what I was kind of alluding to earlier is I'm often surprised sometimes that it can take a year, two years mm -hmm. or five years or eight years or 10 years to, to work through these issues. And we feel like that it should happen quicker or it should be, as you mentioned, like I have my diagnosis, I have my treatment, I have the conclusion that I can put this away and move past it. But um, at a certain point, um, you almost have to, I guess, eliminate those expectations. It almost kind of has to fall into almost a stoicism of sorts of like objectively it takes what it takes what's required of me is what's required it'll take as long as it takes like is there a certain movement towards putting the emotion aside and just mm -hmm. getting really objective really great questions um i'm going to tell you what my philosophy is and again i'm not a therapist i am not a world re renowned leader in grief and trauma and all of that but i can tell you what I do. Um, I just accept that this is the feeling. And I, we could talk a lot about acceptance because people either feel relief around that wor word or they want to punch the, the YouTube. <laughs> and as an A type person, you want to punch the YouTube, you don't you? <laughs> punch the YouTube. Um, for me, there's no getting over, right? There's moving through. And I think especially when we think about grief and loss and trauma, and we think about, you know, these big ruptures in our life. Um, if we can make peace with the fact that, you know, we can't amputate any of our emotions or experiences and expect to be whole. There isn't necessarily a trophy or a finish line or somebody there to pat you on the back. You may always have this feeling. I will always, always experience sorrow around the loss of my dad who passed a few years ago. I will always have sorrow around my own diagnosis. And so to expect for that to be eradicated, I think is to, in some ways, um, not only set the bar so high for yourself emotionally, but it's kind of not how it works in my estimation. And so what I say is like, there isn't a timeline, there isn't a finish line. It's like, this is a part of me too. And that doesn't mean that if I have experienced something very difficult that I can't also create beautiful new experiences around that. So I can still have, I can have a hole in my heart, but I can put joy around it. I can have 
beautiful new friendships around it. I can have new levels of meaning around it. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And that's the thing that I think many of us would benefit from. You know, I think it's Stumbling on Happiness. Um, I think that's the name of the book. It was written in 2005 by... I want to say the guy's name's Gilbert. I said I'm terrible. That I'm like, I think the book was this. I think that was the name. But um, I read a book and I think it's called Stumbling on Happiness <laughs> where... Uh, where this professor said that he was the life of the party because he would often go to parties and and kind of ask people really difficult questions. You might imagine that I'm kind of the same way. Um, but he liked to ask people to pose, to kind of have this um, um, experiment in their minds. Let's imagine that you're a parent and that you lost one of your children. Mm. And it's um, one of the most devastating things that can happen. And now it's two or three years later. How do you feel? And every single respondent is just devastated. It's they're like, I lost my child. Like, um, I have a friend who lost her child, her teenage child, in a car accident in uh, November. And um, I've learned a little bit more about grief because I'm so uncomfortable with it that I never want to mention it or talk it about it and bring it up. But I've learned that it's like, no, like the parent never wants to stop speaking about their child because. They're always there. And so anyway, this in this book, he said that he'd go to a party and he'd ask people and they would say like three years later, like just devastated. I could never go on. And people tend to not account for the fact that over three years, so many new life experiences have happened. That that in those three years that the, the grief has maybe diminished, that the immediate um, searing pain has maybe gone down a bit. You've had new moments, new memories, life has gone on as painful or difficult as it might be. And and overwhelmingly, when, when parents do lose their children and a few years go by, it's not like that pain has ever really stopped, but it's not the center of their universe forever. Mm. Earlier, I was asking you about cancer and you're like, well, I don't think about it every day. Um, is it? Do you think it's maybe a similar experience? I've never lost a child, so I have no... I, sorry, yeah. I'm not comparing those. I just mean in terms of acceptance, grief, this change, and that most of us who are, who, or I'm speaking for myself, when I'm afraid of what might be and what might happen, I don't tend to account for the fact that life does go on. A hundred percent. Yes. I think, can our grief soften? That's the hope. That's the hope. Um, but life does move on. That we are we're blessed because that means we're still alive. So while we have the opportunity to still be alive, how are we going to spend that time honoring our children, honoring the people we've lost by keeping their memories alive, by talking about it, by having conversations around, you know, difficult topics? Because this is something we do as a society need to normalize more because just look at the past few years. So many of people that we know have experienced such big losses, you know, and what you said is so spot on. I know it, at times in my own life, being terrified to talk about grief, not only my own grief, but somebody else's grief, and then not mentioning it at all, you know, running the other way. I have a chapter in the book that's called Awkward Times, Awkward People, including you, you know what I mean? Because we all do it because again, we don't know what to do. So we want to try to change that. Um, the hope is that we choose to keep living and that as we make that choice and the more we make that choice, the more that grief softens. Again, it doesn't go away. Have you ever re read uh, Five Regrets of the Dying by Bonnie Ware? Yes, I love Bonnie. So a few years ago when I got the book, uh, I'd say three years ago when I got the book, it was life-changing for me because I realized how unhappy I was with the life I kind of found myself at. Um, I think many of us have that journey where we don't, we think we're making decisions, but we're not. We think that we're have a direction, but we don't. And we find ourselves at a place where we're just like, yes, not, I'm not happy with any of this stuff. And so I was reading her book, Five Regrets of the Dying, for those who haven't read it. Um, uh, Bonnie Ware was, uh, was, uh, became an end of life care supporter. So she would be hired by families to stay with, um, mostly usually elderly uh, uh, patients who were in their last weeks or days of their life and she would be there to be with them. And she kept noticing that they kept bringing up the same types of regrets. 
uh, regrets like I I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Uh, I wish I had put myself first. Um, things like that. And so I, I read this book and I was perfectly at the point in my life where I was like, I don't want my life to be like this for the rest of my life. Bonnie is, is saying that at the end of people's lives, they have these regrets. I don't want to have those regrets. And so I just chose to just accept them as true. But here's the way that my brain works. Just because a bunch of people regret something at the end of their life doesn't actually mean it's true. Mm. Just because you hit the end of your life and you go, oh, I wish I didn't work so hard. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have worked so hard and doesn't mean that it's even accurate because you're a different person by the time you hit there. And so anytime that I have a chance to connect with someone like you, someone who um, has spent more time than most thinking about this perhaps, I often wonder about that thing that all entrepreneurs get told, which is like, you don't want to die with regrets. You got to make it happen. You got to do it. And I'm curious if that fuels you with what you're doing and what you're building and making the most of your time, or if you have a different perspective on it, more like maybe Bonnie Ware and the five regrets of the dying, or maybe you have some kind of hidden secret, like it's all just bullshit. <laughs> Can I have all of them? Yeah. <laughs> Can I have all of them? <laughs> Did I answer the question already? Yeah. No, I, I look it, different times in my career, I would have answered it differently. So in the early stages of my career, I was all about the accolades. You know, everything was a trophy, everything, getting on Oprah, New York Times bestseller, having a documentary. My documentary premiered at South by Southwest. I sold it to the Discovery Channel um, and then own. And like everything was like another notch of accomplishment. And all of those are wonderful things. And I remember when we um, submitted the film for a uh, Emmy and we didn't get nominated and I was pissed. You know, it was just like, man, what? How's and that shit got nominated? You know what I mean? Like, I was so pissed. Talk about losing sight of the forest for the trees, right? But my point is that I've had different goals along the way. That is none of that shit is my goal now. Like, none of that are my goals. It's not about the numbers. It's not about like the followers. It's not about any of it. It's about contentment, to tell you the honest truth. Like, do I like showing up for my job? Do I get to talk to cool people like you? Do I get to write and do the things that creatively fire me up? You know, do I, am I comfortable enough? And honestly, do I have more free time than grind? Because I didn't have any free time. And there's been seasons of work where I haven't had free time. And so I'll take my free time over like continuing to ratchet up those accolades. And maybe that is a result of some of the work that I've done and certainly some of, especially the work in the last five years that I've done. How do you hold your ambition in one side and uh, let's say your calm nature? I don't know. Like, how, how do you hold these two different sides of you? The ambitious side who wants to make stuff still happen and the side of you that goes, it's better to live a slower life that that is maybe more um, magical? Yeah, my life isn't that slow. I would like it to be slow and magical. Like <laughs> Slightly that's the vision. slower life. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, I've seen videos of you saying like, I love being outdoors and I love this. And it's I like, need it that. recharges I, me. <laughs> yes, I need that. I totally need that. So to answer your question, they arm wrestle. They arm wrestle. It's not like I'm just like, I am so Zen and contentment is good, you know, and like, no ambition. I, it bad, you know, none of that. Like I got right before I hopped on with you, I looked, I checked my email and I have, uh, my publicist, um, said, Hey, and I won't say what the national media show is like, Oh, they're interested in having you on the show. We need the pitch by the end of the day. And it's to do something that I have to make very actionable. And um, I really have to be thoughtful about the pitch. And to tell you the honest truth, like who doesn't want to be on a national show? It's like, it's great. Hey, it would be awesome if we could make this happen. I don't feel aligned with the segment. So, and I also don't feel aligned with hustling and then canceling my Mark interview because I have to, you know, because they, they, the producer needs the the decision by today so that they can pitch it to like their boss tomorrow. And I'm like, you can't give me four hours when I've got back-to-back -back podcasts and expect me to like hustle a pitch for you about something I'm not actually that interested in. 
So I'm trying to show you this as an example of like choosing contentment versus ambition. Yeah. If this was a pitch that was like literally about like the topic that I'm very passionate about right now, because it's my book, it's about grief, it's about loss, I wouldn't cancel on you, but I'd figure it out. So you mean sometimes the decisions come from that place of like, this doesn't feel like it's in in alignment. And I've spent 52 years hustling and that offer ain't worth the hustle. You spent 52 years hustling? Are you saying you're 52 years old? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> Audience, you've just caught me. Uh, I, I try not to ever be caught off guard by the guests, but you just caught me <laughs> off guard there. I did not know that. Uh, okay. Listeners, <laughs> Chris does not look 52 years old. <laughs> so let's go back to plant-based. <laughs> there you go. See? <laughs> is, it, is it really like... I like the idea of plant-based. <laughs> it's a very touchy subject because... Um, I've just been, I am under the impression it's actually not healthy for you. That, that people feel better. They do it for three or four weeks or six weeks, but they don't do it right. They don't get, they don't get the macros properly. They don't get the nutrition they need. And they start to like turn green and their hair thins out and they look terrible and they feel terrible. And they're like, Oh, but I'm living this great lifestyle. Um, (laughs) so have I just been brainwashed by like American media into believing that plant-based is not good? Yeah. I don't know what media you're watching, but I... You just said, what? You're 52 years old. Yeah. And you just told everybody, I've been living with stage four cancer for 20 years. So I will just say, I am not the (laughs) poster child for plant-based living, but you can do anything in an unhealthy way. Right. And so I just take that, just take that in. Like, I, I think the most important thing is for people to eat more plants. It's like, let's find the common denominators. You know what I mean? And um, there's also a ton of junk food in plant in vegan in a vegan diet, right? There's a ton of processed food. Um, but there's a lot of really healthy, real whole foods filled with fiber and all of the good stuff, phytochemicals, you know, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, all the things that we need. You don't have to do anything hundred percent. I think the point is, are we making healthier choices more often than not? Even as a meat eater, you know what I mean? Are we making healthier choices more often than not? That's what I try to teach my community. I've written a lot of books on plant-based living and 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 they are not for people to go 100%. It's like my goal, my victory, just when I'm talking about diet. So I teach what I call the five pillars of wellness and it's about optimizing, but also being mindful about like, so not perfect about what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're thinking and how you're resting and renewing. And so if we were to say like, we all eat different ways, how can we come together and one on one point, each vegetables, right? I'm lucky. I, I love vegetables. So yeah. I'm very lucky. I can't vegetables. imagine dieting if, <laughs> if you didn't, if, if all you liked was like meat and processed foods and stuff, I couldn't even imagine that. But um, you can change your tastes in like, I've done this because I've gone on, on cuts or I've gone on times where I've removed caffeine or I've removed sugar or I've removed salt or I went on keto. And it's like, I know your taste can change. So I've never thought of this for all the people who are like, I don't like vegetables. You can like change your tastes and your habits. So that way you can like them, right? I mean, that that can be done, right? Nope, it's genetic. You were either born loving oh, vegetables or not. <laughs> so if that's not you, sorry, Sally. <laughs> you're being sarcastic. I know. I sound like an idiot now, don't <laughs> no, I? No, I was just trying to make you laugh. Um, <laughs> yes, of course. You know, I, look, when I first started this diet, I love Burger King. I wasn't a McNod- McDonald's girl. I was a Burger King girl. Okay. And so fast foods, processed foods, you know, a lot of sugar, fake foods, trans fats, like more the better, you know, can I get a Marlboro Light with that on a Saturday, a, Mar- a Marlboro Red, you know, like... I did not come from a healthy background in any way, shape or form. I was like, diet is what you do to stay thin. You know, it, it was not like, no, this is how you feel your body and your cells and nourish yourself. And so that you can like, live long and prosper. You know what I mean? So that was not at all wh- where I came from. And I remember w- when I was changing my diet, originally I became macrobiotic. And so to go from like, I'll go to my Starbucks and get my scone and do my thing to I will have a bowl of miso soup and a and a skull cap of rice <laughs> to start my day. I was like, ah, oh, the detox symptoms were on fire. All this stuff tastes like garbage to me. I mean, the first time 
I joke about this, but I, I literally left the doctor and went to Whole Foods because I was like, I don't know where else to go. I think vegetables are healthy. I want to control something. I got to control the fuck out of something. I can, I can change my diet. I went to Whole Foods and I like was cruising the vegetable aisle and I was like, uh, I think that these things have expiration dates, though I'm not sure. Definitely not like spam. And I saw kale for the first time and I was like, I don't know what's going to kill me, the cancer or this weed. I do not know, but here I am finding myself in this shit pickle of life. Slowly but surely, Mark, slowly but surely, I was like, oh, as soon as I started to change my diet, my palate started to change. Like a ripe piece of mango would be like, oh my God, that's actually tastes better than a Snickers, you know? And then learning how to make stuff. So I'm not the best cook on the planet. I do have cookbooks, but I also hire recipe developers. Let's be real. You know what I mean? But I know what I like and I know what what tastes good and how to present it. But in the beginning, I didn't know how to do this stuff. So it's like just that willingness to experiment and say, I can make a delicious sauce with this. Like everything's good with olive oil, salt and pepper. You know what I mean? (laughs) So yeah, tomato, cucumber. Maybe a little feta in there. Oh, or wait, you can't have feta. It's not plant-based. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it, it, it's not about what I can't have. It's what I, it's about what I choose, right? Oh, okay. It's about what how I did, choose. How did you arrive at that? How I arrived at that. And by the way, there's like so many wonderful like nut-based cheeses and stuff like that. Um, I mean, we live in such a different time. And now I feel like an OG grandma. Like back in my day, Mark. You know, we had a pencil and we were lucky and that's how we made our books. <laughs> you know, um, but there's so many great innovative uh, companies now doing beautiful things. So I say I choose because it's easy for people to go to this place of, oh yeah, who the fuck wants more deprivation? Right. And so we, we never want to put ourselves in that place of lack. And it, I can have feta right now if I wanted to. Absolutely. You know, I know how I feel with cheese. I don't feel great. Um, so it's really about, you know, just talking about that. Like your body tells you what works and what doesn't. Not the latest blogger, not the latest bro, not the latest influencer, sometimes not even the latest dietitian du jour sweeping. You know what I mean? It's like, try it. See how it feels for you. Now you've written a lot of books. Um and some of them are cookbooks and some of them are on diet and juicing and all these other things. And your latest book, I'm Not a Morning Person. Um, what is your favorite book and why? That I have written? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we could talk about your favorite book ever, but you've covered so much ground. And I'm often wonder, because because your answer is just, you know, your official answer, your publisher wants you to say is the latest one, of course. <laughs> but, but I'm more curious because you've had such a, a good, a long career and you've had the opportunity to do so much. I'm wondering if there's one where you're like, you know what, this is really the one and here's why. It's the latest one. And it's not just because <laughs> my publicist and publisher want me to say that. <laughs> no, I will tell you why that this is the one, because this is the one that is the most vulnerable. This is the most vulnerable book I've ever written. This um, has a lot of heartbreak and a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of what inspires me and helps me in this book. And uh, when I started to write this book, I set two intentions. One was for the reader and one was for me. And for the reader, it was to normalize conversations about grief and loss and to give you new resources and stories to help you feel less alone so that you could cope and move through, right? Hopefully move through and be like, yes, I want to embrace what Chris calls fully alive living. So that was the intention and is the intention for the reader. Um... The intention for me was to push myself as a writer and to stretch myself creatively and to stretch myself in a way where I was willing to tell stories about my life that felt very um, raw and embarrassing and sometimes shameful, you know, stuff that I was still processing and working on. Um, Because I think we learn through stories like a lot of times we look at people and we say they've oh they've got it all and life must be so great for them and then when we ever get the opportunity to hear what's really going on it doesn't make us sometimes it can make us feel better about ourselves but more often than not i think what it says is like yeah you know what being human's hard it is messy 
You know, one person isn't better than the other and we all struggle with this. And I think it brings us together more um, as opposed to he's here and I'm there. And it's like, if you really talk to him, you'd see that both of you are probably, you know, brothers. I remember back when I was younger, I had this transformative moment. Now, this is more in a corporate setting. But I was interviewing the CEO of a large multinational insurance company. Um, and uh, the people who were uh, my clients were... This is such a big company. I think they were like nine levels below. <laughs> and so they were all sitting in the back of the room in the dark, kind of like really nervous. And, you know, the CEO walks in and he is just a regular guy. And so I start asking the soft questions and then I realize, oh, okay, like he's trained, he's done his job. He's the CEO of this multi-billion dollar company. He can handle a few hard questions. So I start had, asking harder questions and harder questions and then more personal questions. And he has a great time. I have a great time and it ends. And um, I say, hey, can we get some shots of you walking around? So can I just walk back to your office with you? And as I'm walking out, his staff is pulls me aside and they said, what are you doing? And they're like so upset with me because I went off script and I went off page. And I was like, well, I just judge you know, his comfort level. He could have said no at any point. And there's going to be editing and we're not the press. So what does this matter? <laughs> anyway, so I walk back with him. And as we're walking back, we just talk, start talking about life. And I, and I have this moment where I realized that if I met this man at a backyard barbecue in my neighborhood, and it was like a Sunday afternoon, and I just met this person and he happened to be there and we were talking, I wouldn't know his role. I wouldn't know how successful he is. I wouldn't know any of those things. He would just be this guy. Yeah. And that thing, that like not judging and not being afraid to approach people thing has served me so well. And sometimes it surprises me. I was at a Tony Robbins event in the front row with my friend Evan Carmichael. And I didn't realize that people are sitting around. <laughs> and a few days later, I'm like, oh, you're an actor in this big show. And, and you work with, you know, like Spike Lee. And oh, you're oh, you're Sean White. You're the snowboarder dude that I didn't even recognize and know who you were. Where, why aren't you wearing your medal like around around your neck all the time? Like, I and your red hair is, is covered. Like, what is going on? But what you were saying is, 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 I think, so true. And it's like the people that we put on a pedestal, we think have either things figured out or they somehow don't have the same challenges we have or they don't have to deal with the same things we have to deal or what have you. And um, the more that I've come to speak to people like you and have people on the podcast and have leaders, and the more I realize like we are all just the same. Um, and that makes me kind of uncomfortable because I, I like thinking I'm better than everyone else, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay, just you, Mark. Just you. But everybody I mean, not John else. Sean White, of course. Sean White's pretty awesome. But, but, but everyone else, I like to feel like I'm better than. <laughs> your, your favorite book is I'm Not a Morning Person. Um, oh, man, I, I just have to think how hard it must be to, to sit there and type out some of these things and go, like, am I really going to say this? Okay, I'm going to say it. And then getting comfortable with it. Do you have a favorite chapter? Oh gosh. Um I I have a I don't know if I have a favorite chapter. I think I have favorite moments in each chapter, but um I'd say that the chapter that was the most in some ways for me beautiful to write, but I cried through it. Um is a chapter called Rest in Love. And it was the chapter where my father passes and I had the ability to be there at his bedside. And, you know, uh, leading up to that, where, like I said, this book is for people going through a difficult time. And the inciting incident is the rupture. For me, the inciting incident was back in 2016. And I was getting off of a big stage where I was giving a keynote to 3,000 people, getting on the plane, being like, now this is over. Uh, then, you know, once this is over, then I'll live was my motto because I just had so much on my plate. I had that feeling like, yeah, now I'm going to live. <laughs> Less to do is more living. And um, the plane's delayed. I couldn't get home. And I go to my parents' house instead because it's super late and they're closer to the airport. And my mom's sitting on the sofa with the lights on at midnight in slacks. Like nothing good happens at midnight when your mother's wearing slacks. You know what I mean? And so I was like, what's going on? And then she tells me that my dad had a mass on his pancreas. And so that was that moment, right? Where everything kind of changed in my life again. And cut to a few years later, a pandemic is, is firing at full speed. 
struggling in areas of my business because I consciously chose to like take my foot off the gas and be a much bigger part of my family's life. And um, so, you know, I'm weaving all these stories in throughout the book because each chapter deals with like a different emotion or experience you may go through if you find yourself in a really rough time. So this particular chapter is truly about losing a loved one. And I think one of the things that's powerful about it was we, I talk about how my father and I started to talk about dying, you know, and when you, you said earlier, which is so astute, none of us are, we're afraid to say the wrong thing. We're afraid to even acknowledge things like grief and loss. And certainly we're probably even more so afraid to do that with somebody who is actively dying. And so in that chapter, I talk about how I approached it, which was my very smart therapist suggested that I begin by talking about it. And so don't hit the conversation head on, but start to talk about, it's almost like a, it's like a warm up session. And that's exactly what we did. I said, look, I, I think you want to talk about this and I want you to know that I definitely want to show up for it. I might get it wrong. I'm going to cry. Um, I might say the wrong thing. I, it, would, it is not my intention. So if you're willing to stumble through this with me, I am so willing to do it. And he said, yes, because this is really lonely because um, everybody else is living and planning and I am dying. And so these beautiful conversations um, are a part of that chapter. And my father blessed me with so much wisdom, with giving me so much great advice. And the, just the way he navigated that experience, um, I felt like it was important for me to pass it on because it changed me. And if somebody else is going through a difficult time, I want to be able to say, here are the words, you know what I mean? That is amazing. Chris Carr, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I always ask this question at the end of every episode, but I feel like it's especially astute based on the conversation we just had. So for you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Okay. Was I a little kinder to myself today than I was yesterday? Because if I was a little kinder to myself today than I was yesterday, and if I was a little bit more compassionate, a little bit understand, more understanding, I'm developing that deeper relationship with myself. And ultimately... That's the relationship that matters most to me. Because uh, when I, that relationship is healthy, other relationships in my life are really healthy too. 